Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming out. The, what we're trying to do is really do a couple things. I'm working really hard to try and expose uh, you to the situation that we have with the health care bill we've got. We want to do two things today. We want to impart some information, and then also, very importantly, we want to hear what you've got to say and your thoughts regarding it. Now, I grew up in Fort Smith. My dad was a master sergeant in the Air Force. I'm a yes sir, no sir kind of guy, okay, as most of you all are. Uh, I've got good friends that feel like this is a great bill. I've got, you know, many, many other good friends that feel like this is not a good bill. So we can disagree, but we're not going to be disagreeable, okay? That's, that's kind of our ground rules. We've got, uh, in an effort, again, to impart some information, we're really blessed today. We've got two guys here that are going to visit with us. They're really in a unique perspective in the sense that not only are they senators, but they're also physicians with many, many years of practice. And so we have Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma. And then we also have... Okay. We'll, well, first of all, thanks for coming. Uh, one of the things that needs to happen in our country is your participation. Uh, the problem with Washington is we're not held accountable, uh, and we need to be held accountable. And one of the reasons we're out of control financially is because the government's doing a whole lot of things that never were intended by our founders. If you look at Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, that's the enumerated powers, and then you look at why we're in trouble, <clears throat> you can see a lot of the reasons that we're in trouble is because we're outside the bounds of what our founders, especially Madison and Jefferson, thought should be our role. <clears throat> healthcare is an important thing. Healthcare in this country is phenomenally good, but phenomenally expensive. A and the problem with healthcare is attaining access because it costs so much. So there's no question we need to do some things that will incentivize efficiency and better care and lower costs in health care, and we can do that. But we can do that, with, in my opinion, without having the government step between you and your provider. And we can do that without spending two to four trillion dollars more over the next 16 years that we're actually going to steal from your children and your grandchildren. So it's not that we don't need to fix certain things and create the incentives where we get much better efficiency. We spend twice in this country per patient than any other country in the world except Switzerland, and we have, if you're really sick, this is the place in the world to be because the outcomes are phenomenal. It, 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 no matter what it is, if it's can I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I'm five and a half years out from colon cancer, metastatic, and I'm alive because of the tremendous strides that have been done in healthcare in this country. The last thing we want to do is take away the incentive to improve the care, but we can do it in a much more effective and efficient way by changing the incentives rather than changing who makes the decisions. And the bills that you have, you see right here, which are the Senate bill and the House bill, uh, uh, create 88 new government programs, 150,000 new federal employees, and 200 times where the Secretary of HHS is gonna make the decisions about your health care, and you're not. And that's not a way to solve health care, in my opinion, as a physician who's delivered over 4,000 babies, and cared from grandmas to babies to broken arms to broken hips to cancer. And so uh, there's no question we can fix things, but the way we're going about it, I believe, is in the wrong direction. And I'd be interested to hear from the people here on what their thoughts Tom, are. Tom not only has had an illustrious medical career, but he actually also is still practicing on Mondays before he goes back uh, to his work in the Senate every week. Yeah, I can see patients at 6 o'clock on Monday morning, so any of you. <laughs> <laughs> I take anybody that walks in. I do everything for free. And, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, practiced for 25 years in Wyoming, took care of everybody, all comers. I uh, was chief of staff of our hospital. My wife's a breast cancer survivor, uh, three operations, two rounds of chemotherapy. So we've seen it from, from, from all the different sides of this. And I've been having town meetings all around Wyoming. The people there are concerned that with this big system, with this government takeover, what they view it as is that it, it's going to cost them more personally than what they're paying now. 
and that the health care they're going to get is going to get worse so that they don't want to pay more and get less and that's kind of what the polls show all across the country people are worried about that they're just people of Wyoming are seeing this as you know too much spending too much debt we're seeing this huge debt and then too many government takeovers so people resoundingly across the state of Wyoming come out to meetings they look at these bills they say anybody going to read them and one you know, Congressman from uh, Michigan said, read it, who would read it? It takes two days and two lawyers in to explain it to you. And I think if you're a member of Congress or the Senate and you can't understand a bill and it takes that long to get through it, and you need that many people to explain it to you, you shouldn't vote for it. The, uh, and we have a number of questions. We'll get to those in a second. I just wanted to, there's a gentleman over here with a World War II veteran cap one. My dad was in the Battle of the Bulge. I appreciate you being here. I know you've served our country. Could we ask anybody here who's ever served in the armed services to please either stand up. Let us, let us thank you for, for all of your service. Thank you. Let, let, me, let me just say something. These are veterans. Some have medical benefits associated with being a veteran. Since when is it a benefit if you don't get to choose where you get your health care? What we say is, yeah, we'll give you health care, but only in one place. And if we really mean to our veterans that we are going to recognize their service and give them a health care, then give them a card and let them go wherever they want. <laughs> See, we have a number of call, uh, yeah, uh, people ahead. filled out questions. Uh, Cindy Sigmund uh, from uh, Rogers. Cindy, are you here? Uh, where are you, Cindy? Good. Uh, you wanted to know about, uh, would Congressman, you want to talk about your question? You want, to, you want to stand up and let us know? Yeah, you asked about members of Congress. I know that Congress is going to insist on, on um, Congress members and the President himself being subjected to this bill. Yeah. Living under the rules that they pass, yeah. <laughs> well, it's really interesting. I'm on the Health Committee. The, the Senate Health Bill, a couple of things that you need to know about it. It passed out of the committee over six weeks ago. They won't print the bill because they didn't want you to be able to read it while we're home on vacation. I passed an amendment, 12 to 11, in the Senate that requires members of Congress to be in any plan we set up. So whatever's good for you, you've got to be a plan <laughs> Also, a co-sponsor of a bill that says the same thing. You know, if it's good enough for the American people, it's good enough for, for Congress, it's good enough for the executive branch, the whole bit. And I think that's probably the reddish flag of all in, in the bill as it first came out was Congress specifically excluded themselves, you know, from the program. Well, the interesting, the people that wrote this bill, 11 out of the 13 voted against putting themselves in it. They were mostly one of one of the parties. Was that right? Well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Caitlin Finn. Uh, Caitlin. Caitlin Finn from uh, Centerton, Arkansas. Are you? Yes. Hi. You. Can I, can I address that? If you look at this bill, the House bill, which has the pay fors in this bill, 55% of the money to pay for the reform, quote reform, comes from small business. <clears throat> Three out of every four jobs in this country are created by small business. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take about seven to eight hundred billion dollars over the next seven years and take it out of small business and give it to the government. That $700 billion is not going to get invested in capital to create new jobs by small business. So uh, that's mainly what's wrong with it. And it's interesting for you to note, it's not, you know, this is, this is $1.4 trillion over six years, but it's actually about $3 trillion by the time you look at the 20-year the cost on it. And there's not enough offsets there to pay for it. So it'll have a devastating effect on small business, but it'll also have a devastating effect on small providers of health care. And just the opposite in the sense that, what, 150,000 new, new, federal, new employees. federal employees to administer the program. So you're, you're shifting from one area to the other area and growing government. 
And uh, Rick Hansen, you had a question about tort reform? Well, first of all, all you got to do is look at the state of Texas. Uh, malpractice premiums have dropped 36 uh, percent. They've had the, a massive influx of physicians coming to the state of Texas. As a matter of fact, Oklahoma's lost almost 200 to Texas. I bet you Arkansas has lost some as well. Their tort reform has markedly decreased the cost of defensive medicine. It's still way too high, but it's there. It's going to take a generation of doctors under a new tort reform to get them out of the habit of protecting their hind ends with tests that nobody needs except to protect yourself in a lawsuit. It's $200 billion a year that we spend on tests that nobody needs. That's 8% of the cost of health care, folks. So if you could just cut that in half, we'd save $100 billion. And we'll have some difference of opinion. Uh, I believe tort reform is a state issue. That's my personal opinion. Uh, I believe that's reserved to the state. If Oklahoma wants to fail with their tort laws, then we get the right as a state to fail. Plus, in the Senate with 65 lawyers, you'll never get tort reform through the Senate. Can you describe in practice as an OB guy how, how the preventive practice, how that does affect you know, the, the drive up cost? Well, it, well, one way it drives up cost, last year I delivered uh, 36 babies as a U.S. Senator. <clears throat> My malpractice premium was $49,000. I don't bill anybody anything, so that's right out of my pocket. This year I'm not delivering babies because the premium was going up. Couldn't afford to do it. But more importantly, <coughs> what it causes me to do is test that they don't, patients don't need. And, and I'll, I'll give you the best example. How many of you have had kids that play summer baseball? Lots of you. What happens now if they get hit in the head with a baseball and they go to the ER? They get a CAT scan. Why do they get a CAT scan? Not because they need it, but because the potential for a lawsuit's there. And when I was trained in medicine, and the same training applies, if they have a normal neurologic exam and you've got a good family around them, you don't need to do a CAT scan. But the hospitals now are so worried about getting sued, they set a protocol that you have to. Now, if you have a normal CAT scan, everybody says, well, that's fine. But you just gave them 10 rads of radiation. And what happens if they get 10 more and 10 more? And pretty soon, our defensive medicine's causing disease rather than preventing disease. So there's all these unintended consequences of defensive medicine practice that actually hurt us. Besides the, the cost of it, we actually can do some harm. So we are in a situation where we're practicing the wrong kind of medicine. And it's changing where we've seen tort reform change. And Texas is a great example of it. Texas has the best tort reform in the country. And that, that means people are still getting taken care of who are injured by doctors through mistakes of doctors. But it means we're no longer being extorted by a trial bar when this country produces more lawyers in one year than Japan has. The other thing, Rick, we are traveling around a little bit as the only two <coughs> doctors who are also senators. And yesterday we were on the border between Iowa and Nebraska do, doing a similar town hall meeting. And uh, for, for doctors who are delivering babies because Nebraska has tort reform and Iowa doesn't, uh, same doctor doing the same procedure depending on which side of that line, the state line, it was 30% more in Iowa than it was in Nebraska for the same doctor to deliver a baby on one side of the line or the other, and that drives up costs, costs for all patients. Um, Jessica Armstrong had a question about government required insurance. Uh, Jessica? We'll get a microphone to you.
Well, there's no question the way it is today, we don't have a, competitive, a truly competitive market in insurance. And those are some of the things that we need to fix. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, if you truly look at the Constitution, we, we, have, we have 11 million people in this country right now that make over $75,000 a year who choose not to buy health insurance. In other words, they make that choice. They say, I think I make enough income that if I have a big problem, I will, I will gamble on that. <clears throat> and of course, they're highly successful at that because most of them are young with not much disease, so their big problem is accidents. But the, the fact is, is they have the freedom to make that choice. <clears throat> Do you really want to live in a country that lessens your freedom and your liberty, your ability to make a decision for you? Do we need the government to make all our decisions for us? The, and, and that's the problem with this. It's not only, you, you don't have to get insurance under this plan. You just have to pay the government money if you don't. Two and a half percent. Two and a half percent of your wages. <clears throat> so tell me how that fits with this document called the U.S. Constitution. There's nowhere in here you can find the authority to do that. And yet you have a Washington that's going to say, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. And so it, it, it is, it, not only are we talking about health reform, we're talking about loss of freedom in health reform. The in ability for you to make good decisions. Now, what we do need to change is we need to change it to where you make good economic choices associated with your health care. In other words, we ought to give you the opportunity to buy really high deductible. We ought to make it available where you can buy any insurance you want. Right now in Oklahoma, you're limited because the state insurance commissioner tells you what you can buy. You, I can't come over here to Arkansas and buy a better policy that's better for my family. Well, you, you know, you can buy your auto insurance anywhere in the country right now. Why shouldn't you be able to buy your health insurance? And why shouldn't we reconnect you with your economic decision if you're purchasing health care, that you connect that with the cost of purchasing that health care? And why shouldn't you be treated the same under the tax code if you don't get your insurance from your employer? If you get your insurance from your employer, you get $2,700 in tax benefits. But if you don't get it from your employer and you buy it yourself, you get 120. How in the world did, that, did we ever allow that to where we, we discriminate against people whose employers don't provide them health insurance? And that's what's wrong with this plan. Because what it's going to do is it's going to force everybody out of their employer-based insurance into a government plan. It's going to move them. Lewin Group, which is renowned worldwide for actuarial analysis on health care, says a hundred, at a minimum, Two-thirds of the people who have insurance through their employers today will lose it, and they'll be in the government-run plan. Well, guess what happens? You know any government-run plan that's on budget and efficient? There's nothing. And Medicare is $39 trillion in the hole right now. We're going to charge to our ch my ch grandchildren and your children and grandchildren, and we're going to create another program just like that. And so we're going to steal opportunity. We're going to steal the future from our children. That's exactly opposite of what these veterans fought for. The veterans fought for one generation making sacrifice so freedom and opportunity can be available for the kids that follow. And, and, and Jessica, you talked also about auto insurance and it, tie it into your individual personal record as a driver and all of those other things. Uh, with, with some of these bills, you can't even do that because of community ratings. I know now in Wyoming, if you have somebody who's young and healthy like you and want to get insurance, it's pretty cheap relative to somebody who's older and has a number of medical problems. But with these, programs and the way they're outlined, it's either going to be a two to one ratio or, or, or one to five, so that young people are going to be significantly discriminated against and pay much higher rates. I mean, that's what they saw in Maine when they put that program into place where a young 30-year-old person who's healthy is now paying $770 a month because they have to have that money cover others, as opposed to the state next door where it's $220 a month for the same person, same age, because of a mandate that everybody gets involved in. Anyway. Uh, Let me just say something, because we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about the problems with this bill, but all of us agree that we've got significant problems with the current system that we need to fix, okay? Portability, you know, the things that Tom just talked about, some of the simple things. Uh, my understanding is if we just made it such that parents could keep their, their the young adults to age 25, that that would take care of seven million people. So we need to tweak the system. The real concern is, in an effort to fix it, that we that we that we essentially do away with all the good things in an effort to fix the bad. Uh, but again, we're very much 
you know, concerned about the current system, we want reform. We just don't feel like this is any way the direction to go in regard to that. Uh, Bonnie Whiting had a question about spending and Social Security and debt. Bonnie, are you? Uh, yes, my concern is. We'll get a microphone to you right away. Public option will lead to public enslavement. Because I'm wondering, are we able to pay a single dollar off our current national debt or a dollar of interest each year? I think I know the answer. Well, you're never, you're never going to do that until you get rid of Enron style accounting in Washington, number one and honestly admit what the real deficit is. Uh, the administration just said it's a little less than 1.6, but they didn't talk about the money they stole from Social Security this year. They didn't talk about the money they stole from the Inland Waterway Trust Fund that runs the Arkansas navigational system through Oklahoma and Arkansas to the Mississippi River. They didn't talk about how they didn't fund the, the federal entire, uh, retirees uh, uh, pension, this money they stole from that or their health care. They didn't talk about any other places that they stole money. So. The, the real deficit's about $1.85 trillion this year. So, look, we have $350 billion worth of pure waste, fraud, and abuse every year in the federal government. We can't get an amendment through that eliminates any of that. And I've offered more amendments than anybody in the history of the Senate. And, and every one of them gets defeated because the bias is to grow the government rather than to make the government efficient and effective. Tom, will you talk about, Tom mentioned the accounting. The 1.6 that they, they estimate or whatever, how that's over the 10 year period, can you talk about how? You mean what it's going to happen? Yeah. Well, our debt today. Well, <coughs> in regard to this health. Well, what's going to happen is you're going to see uh, a, a marked increase. Right now, our debt's supposed to, in the next, by 2019, is supposed to be $23 trillion. It's 11.6 right now. If this bill goes through, it's going to be closer to $30 trillion. Now, think about if a child's born today with the unfunded liabilities that are out there plus the debt, they, they come into this world owing $500,000 for us. By the time they're 20, if you have 5% interest on that, they're at a million dollars. How do you fund the interest to do that? How do you continue to give them an opportunity to go to college, own a home, and have a great job if, in fact, we strangle them with debt? <clears throat> so, so, you know, part of the reaction on the health care bill isn't health care. It's the fact that here's another program that's going to markedly extend our debt, and we're not going to run efficiently, <clears throat> and I think a vast majority of Americans, not just in our area of the country, <clears throat> but across the country are saying, time out. Well, you're gone way too far. Have you gone too far already in terms of debt and the compounding of the Sure. But, but, I'm with you. I agree. I agree too, and I, I think you do that with a spending cap amendment, you know, a balanced budget type situation. The line item veto. In Wyoming, we live within our means, have a balanced budget amendment. We can only pass a balanced budget. The governor has a line item veto, and we live within our means as all the family, families do in this country. It, the, the, the problem with this bill, that I see this, is also some of the trickery to keep the cost at close to a trillion dollars. And one of the tricks that they're using is they're going to collect taxes on this for nine years, but they're only going to be given services for the last six years. And it's that's the way that they say, well, that's how we can keep it under a trillion dollars. But in the reality, and Tom, the math is that then after the 10 years out, then it goes to over two trillion dollars a year. Yeah. In this bill, um, in this bill, Arkansas in 2013 will face $500 million in increased Medicare, Medicaid expenses. So that's not paid for by the federal government that you're going to get absorbed in 2013. <clears throat> $500 million is going to come to Arkansas that is going to be mandated by the federal government that you have to spend on Medicaid. And every governor is opposed to that, regardless of party. Yeah. Uh, Bipartisan, they're calling it the, uh, the, the mother of all unfunded mandates, and the people in this room are going to get up, hit with those tax bills uh, if this goes through. Uh, let's see, uh, Daryl uh, Levick had a question on um, Social Security, baby boomers, Medicare. Yeah, hi, Daryl. She's, she's, she's going to bring a microphone to you. Yes, I want to say thank you for gentlemen like yourself. 
yourselves that are up there worshiping, fight for us. My question is, uh, as we all realize, uh, we've got a big influx of baby boomers and we're getting Social Security and Medicare. And that's going to 15 years, 278 billion. I think that's a great question. You know, Medicare goes broke in 2017. The question is, why do you do this tremendous expansion, one of the biggest expansions of anything that the government's done in the current situation? You know, when you can't when you can't do the obligations that you've already committed. To. Well, let me answer you bluntly what they intend to do. <clears throat> they intend to ration your care. And if your your life it will be set up on a metric based on your age and your medical condition, and they'll do just like England, you're too old or not valuable enough to get your hip fixed or to get this cancer treated, goodbye. That's exactly what the intention is. And I can tell you that because three times on our committee, we put in amendments that would prohibit rationing to seniors under Medicare. And all three times it was voted down, although they said they don't want to ration. But if you don't want to ration, why would you not accept an amendment that says it prohibits it? So the intent is to control the cost on Medicare is to ration the care for the, 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 our greatest citizens, the people we're supposed to be honoring, our seniors. And that's exactly where they intend to get the money. They intend to not spend it and, and make a value judgment by the government of what your life's worth. Thank you. And you know, the president talks about saving quote, saving, I think it's a cut, of $500 billion in Medicare. And I said, I don't see that the money is there. And one of the things he talks about eliminating is a program called Medicare Advantage, which I know in Wyoming we have 3,000 people on that program. And I think it does a little more in terms of health prevention and coordinating care, uh, but yet he says across the board he wants to remove that. Although at the same time, he says if you like, have something that you like, you get to keep it. But the 3,000 people in Wyoming on that program like it, but he doesn't want them to keep it. So it's fascinating when you try to deal with this whole system. Um, see, Carrie um, Chastain, I think it is, has a question about home health care. Carrie? Uh, She's bringing a microphone to you. I don't think it's mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the, but the, TV, cam the TV cameras do. <clears throat> They just wanted 18, so I didn't grow it. I gave maybe gave them 16. 
So they got an increase, but it wasn't as much increase as they want. So it's real important how you talk about these issues. And for us to be have any credibility, we've got to be accurate when we criticize it. So there's not a true cut. It's just a decrease in the growth, the, the rate of growth. Uh, Lee Hill has a question about uh, paying for the uninsured. Lee? Hi. Hi. I have a question regarding the uninsured, and it's in reference primarily to the legal immigrants in our societies and across the nation. Um, who is going to be responsible for the uninsured at this point? Is that going to be part of this bill? And if so, what are those numbers? The actual numbers right now. Six million illegal immigrants have health insurance that through their employers. Uh, five million do not. Uh, you are paying for them already because the cost of caring for them is getting transferred to your private insurance. Uh, when you add together the underpayment of Medicare and Medicaid plus the cost of those people who are uninsured, you pay an extra $1,800 per family per year for your health insurance. So you're already, but the problem is, is that's terrible care. There's no question we need to solve the immigration problem, and you do that first by controlling the border. You can't do anything inside until you do something outside to where you stop the flow. And we've made great progress. We've, we've it's decreased it by about 75%, and that will continue, hopefully. Uh, we haven't seen much from the Obama administration on that yet. But the, the real answer is out of that 47 million, how many are really in trouble? And there are about 11 million of our neighbors who do not have the resources, who are not eligible, who are truly struggling with health care. And since one out of every three dollars that we're spending in health care today doesn't help anybody get well or prevent them from getting sick, the question we ought to be asking government, why don't you change the system so we got a much more efficient system that gives us better value so that the dollars we're spending on health care actually go to health care? rather than to create more of a government-run program that's going to be highly inefficient and spend more dollars and still only cover 16 million of the 47 million. And by the way, 15 million, 15 million of people that are uninsured today are eligible for Medicare and SG, Medicaid and SGA. They're just not signed up. Right. In this bill, though, will illegal immigrants that are not members of our country be covered? Will we be supporting their health care by paying? I don't know on the House bill. Well, the House bill, <coughs> You know, it, it doesn't say that illegal immigrants will be covered. What it does do, though, is that there is no verification. So, so they are essentially, you sit down and you say, I'm a citizen. I mean, this is from somebody on the skirt of the rules. I'm a citizen. They check the box and you're in. And that's a real problem. You know, it's one thing to provide emergency care, which we should be doing, but it is another thing to be part of our health care system. The expense would be tremendous. The other thing is, I think that rewards behavior you don't want. I think that, that if illegal immigrants are allowed to, to, to become that easily part of our healthcare system, I think you'll have a lot more illegal immigration as a result of that, because that's a huge deal you know, to become part of the United States healthcare system. The, and the answer to your question is there, it's silent on prohibiting them. So by, by default, they're covered. So you're going to be paying tax dollars for putting them into a government-run health care system. Well, and that's my point. My point is, is that I don't feel like people who don't pay taxes should be part of a program that we develop for our health care system. I agree. If I they agree. don't contribute to the system, I don't feel like we should have to cover them. I agree. I agree. You're right. So As do the vast majority of the, the people in the 3rd District of Arkansas. Uh, Carol Graham had a question about the uh, willingness to pay a higher tax in a single payer program. Carol, would you like to? Sure, let's see a show. Anybody like Carol's idea? Well, a single payer. The option is, is you pay more taxes, the government pays for everybody's health care. Right. 
British system, Canadian system. Just, just remember what comes along with that, though. Every system we have today is bankrupt. This one will be too, and the control of cost, like every other country in the world that has single payer, the control of cost is rational. I feel like healthcare is rational now. Well, not near to the extent it is in the countries that have single payer. So, you know, and that's that's great. There's another question for you, though. Where do you find the authority in the U.S. Constitution for the federal government to run a <laughs> some personal responsibility to be responsible for your health and your family? Or is the government responsible for everything associated with you? Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a fundamental question we need to ask in this country because the reason we're in trouble and the reason our kids' future has been mortgaged is because we've abandoned personal responsibility and accountability and we've said we'll add it to our kids' future. And both of them are bankrupt. So you want to create another bankrupt program? You know, we have to take care of people. Well, we do, but, but, but let, 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 let me, let me, let's continue this debate. This is a great debate. Is it, is it efficient to care for the people in Northwest Arkansas by sending money to Washington, then taking 20% of the money away, and then coming back with a whole bunch of rules to tell you how to take care of the people in Northwest Arkansas? Or could you as a community figure out a way to do it better, which by the way is constitutional, and solve the problems and get, and remember, there's no compassion in any government program. There's only compassion when I spend and sacrifice for me for you to help you. And what we've lost is compassion as we've run things through the government. And we've also tremendously increased the costs. So there, you have a legitimate position, I wouldn't deny you. You, you say, I want a single government pay it, I want to pay taxes and let the government take care of all of it. The question is, is all the innovation in healthcare, three, three out of every four innovations in the world come out of this system. And when you do that, innovation in healthcare is going to stop because there's not going to be the reward for MRI development, for new cancer drugs. It's not going to come. And so the advance in terms of healthcare modernization and d disease treatment and cure is going to slow way down. The other thing you give up with that is the biggest job potential creator for us to make new jobs for Americans is healthcare innovation. And when we take away the stimulus for that, which is a private sector, the, the, the final point I would make with you is what other areas in our country have we abandoned market forces to allocate scarce resources and actually done better? There's not one. I mean, look at the auto companies today. We've decided we're not going to let markets work. We're not going to let them go broke when they should have gone broke. We're going to save them. And what's the consequences of that? Is your kids owe about $80 billion for GM alone. I mean, it, well, but it's the same principle. It is the same principle. Markets will allocate it. And what we need to be is, you know, Jesus said, love your brother as yourself. And we need to be about loving it. And you can't love through the federal government. But I can love you and help you. The reality, and then there's, you know, nobody can argue with this. The reality is Medicare goes broke in 2017. 10%, and Tom's got even higher figures than that, but 10% at least is just wasted across. Okay? Why would you greatly expand a system that's failing and you're taking $500 billion out of it? to help pay for this because 1.6, the cost of this thing are just staggering. Why would you do that? It makes no sense at all. The other thing about the bureaucracy, and, and I agree, we have bureaucracy at the federal level, we've got bureaucracy out of the insurance companies. But I'll tell you, if I don't like the bureaucracy of my insurance company, then I can switch insurance companies. If we do this other system where there's 16 or 18 people that literally determine for everybody, what procedures are adequate, what are not adequate, what's going to be charged, what's not going to be charged. The president appointing all of those people, you know, coming out of the executive branch, and it doesn't matter who the president is. That's a tremendous concentration of power. It's a tremendous concentration of 16, 18% of the economy. And 
that's not a good situation. So I agree we need reform, but this truly isn't the answer. Socialism Maybe. works till you run out of somebody else's money. <laughs> and, it, and, you talk, and you talk about fraud in the system, you look at Medicare fraud, right? And the drug dealers in Florida are getting out of being drug dealers and moving into Medicare fraud because it's more profitable, less chance of getting caught, and if you get caught, the punishment is less. So when you look at that, you know, it's a, it's a system you say, this is not what we want as a model for America. You the, uh, a lot of emphasis on private enterprise. Are we so, so short memory to, to see what's happened uh, here with private enterprise? Do, do, you, do you think private enterprise caused that? How about putting some of that burden on Congress? Congress didn't do the oversight. Congress created the GSEs. Congress socialized the risk of owning a home. Congress didn't do what it should have done. And when you socialize that risk, what you did is transfer the ability for all of us to pay for the mistakes. And the direction that the criticism ought to be is on Congress. Free enterprise didn't fail this country. Congress did. Okay. Uh, we got a list of questions. We got a list of questions. We, we got a list of questions. Elaine Rooney is next with her question. Elaine, you had a question about getting good ideas into a bill. Elaine, thanks. Well, I would tell you, the thing you don't know is there's six other plans that are out there that eliminate pre-existing illness, all right? That, that totally eliminate it, so nobody's, that prevent anybody from ever filing bankruptcy over a health bill, prevent anybody from ever losing their home over a health situation, that actually save money and emphasize prevention and emphasize the management of chronic disease and saves over $1.2 trillion over the next 16 years. So it, you just haven't heard about them because the media wants single payer system. You haven't heard about the other ideas and when we offered it, it got voted down in the committee, 1310. But it was a way to cover everybody. It was a way to take the, the stigma off of Medicaid patients. You know, we say we give Medicaid patients health care. Do you realize that 40% of the primary care doctors won't see a Medicaid patient? And 65%, and now why won't they? Because their overhead won't allow them to do it. Because the cost of meeting the malpractice insurance and the government requirements on paperwork, they lose money every time they see one. So there are other ideas out there, good ones, but this has not been a bipartisan effort. There's been no attempt at it because we only won one amendment out of 700 in the Senate markup, and the vote was 1310 every time. 1310, 1310, 1310. In other words, there was no consideration of an idea other than what was written and brought forward. Can't you get that word out? Right. Well, that's, we're doing it today. Well, and, and it's interesting getting the word out. I think we actually introduced, there were over 100 amendments that were, quote, accepted, but it was because we were proofreading the bill, getting the punctuation right, the yeah. spelling right. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, we took a hundred, what, a hundred and some? Yeah, but they, they were nothing amendments other than drafting errors. And I, again, the biggest driver is the American people. And this is, a, this is a, uh, an issue that's not been like any other issue. America's engaged, and, uh, which is a great thing. It really is. These kind of meetings are going on all over the country right now. And, uh, you know, Americans are speaking. And Elaine talked a little bit about the work about pre-existing condition. We have a number of questions about pre-existing con uh, conditions. Uh, Jim Hallisey, I think, kind of summed it up. Jim, would you like to ask your question about pre-existing conditions? Yeah, I think it's the same question that's here five or six times. So, with, without getting into the specific. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen.
can address it. Here's the thinking behind that. They look at Medicare and they say, well, Medicare only costs about four or five percent to administer. And then they look at the health insurance industry. And if you look at their 10Ks, uh, what they file every quarter, you see 19.1%, which includes their profit in it. And they say, well, gosh, four or five percent versus 19.1%. The only problem is they're doing Enron accounting because Medicare last year had $80 billion worth of fraud. That's 20% of everything we spent on Medicare. So, and the private insurance industry had 1%. So when you compare apples with apples, the government is about 40% less efficient than the inefficient insurance industry. Now, I, I agree, as a physician, I can't stand insurance companies. But I can stand them a whole lot better than a government bureaucracy who makes their decision this way. Never do what is best for America when you can do what is safe for the bureaucracy. And if you go interface anywhere else in the federal government, what you will find is that's the axiom under which it's operated. We will get rid of, if we pass any bill law, we'll get rid of pre-existing bills as a condition. There is no question we can do that. And we do it by penalizing the insurance companies that cherry pick. And it's called risk readjustment. And it works throughout the world. The other countries that are using it, it works well. So insurance, what we want insurance for is we want insurance to cover us all. And we want to spread the risk among us all. And that's what you do with single payer. That's what you're saying. Except when the costs become too great, you either add taxes or you ration care. Whereas you, and you take individual choice away and freedom away from Americans as you do that. And that's why I'm adamantly opposed to it, is you take my choice away. When I'm 75, the last thing I want is some bureaucrat, some ivory tower doctor who's decided what my care would be, who's never talked to me, never examined me, never laid their hands on me, doesn't know my past medical history or my complicated uh, problems, and then they're gonna mandate how I get treated. If you want, a, you want a disaster for poor outcomes, that's it. Works on 70% of the people, but 30% it's a disaster for. And now we have a question from a doctor who's in the audience, Mitch Singleton, uh, Dr. Singleton. She's bringing a microphone to you right now. How are we doing on the top? She said we can go a little later. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your service. I was a As you say, I know a number of physicians who, if this goes through, they're finished. They'd say they just retire and they'd had enough. And uh, the question is, even if all this goes through, are there going to be enough doctors to take care of the people? They have this Massachusetts medical care program, and there are more doctors per capita in Massachusetts than anywhere, even though they've passed this large program, huge expenses, much more than they have ever expected. That means they're taking money away from education, away from fire, away from police uh, to pay for the system, still with a huge gap in the uh, in the expenses, and, uh, and so people are having a hard time finding physicians. We don't have the health care providers. Think about this. One in 50 med school, medical school graduates 
last year went into primary care internal medicine pediatrics or family practice what do you think that happened yeah if, if you want to tell us yeah. <laughs> if, if you want to increase primary care then you pay for primary care <clears throat> you there's a 350 percent payment differential from who you see at first to the biggest sub super sub specialist with maybe two years training difference that's by design Medicare sets that because, because pretty soon, with that kind of turnover rate going in and the old family practice docs like me leaving, that means you're not going to see a physician in the future. You're going to see a physician extender. And they're very valuable. They're very well trained. But they have a limited ability to diagnose and treat. But the government's plan is to shift away from doctors. That's why they want a cookbook medicine. That's why they want to use physician extenders. And that's why they've not paid for primary care, because they intend to eliminate that aspect. So we need less doctors. Now, we have a whole lot more people going to need doctors, but we have a system that's incentivizing a decrease in the number of doctors. Ask yourself what's going on there. And then Dr. Chitwood uh, is a radiologist. Are you, are you still here, Dr. Chitwood? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can bring a microphone up, because I used to actually practice with this guy. <laughs> Is that a disclaimer? No, no. <laughs> One of the things I was impressed about when I started my radiology career was I went into practice in Scully, Oklahoma, and there was a young family practice doctor named Tom Coker. He was able to deliver lots of babies, and he exercised the best clinical test that I've ever seen in my life, uh, all the way through training. And he didn't need any drug tests, but he, he used his common sense and his training to and that's all gone by the wayside. People were tested because of pressure and get sued if they don't. So what are the tests? And we hit it by on the head. And if I want to see one thing in government these days, it's just a return to common sense. Yeah. And um, I'd like to see you run for president. That's what I mean. <laughs> I have an answer for that, Dr. Chipwood, and let me, let me explain. <clears throat> and, and this may rub some people the wrong way. How can you expect members of Congress to have common sense when they don't have any worldly experience outside of politics? <laughs> We're expecting people to have common sense when they have no exposure to it. I mean, they don't. And so, you know, my, what I tell town halls in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and throughout Oklahoma, what you really need to do is fire us all and, and get a new team up there. That was, that was the biggest applause line of the whole day. <laughs> you know, George McGovern, George McGovern, who ran for president and, and, and failed, and he had, you know, he'd been a governor, the senator from South Carolina. Dakota for those many years, and he, when he retired from the Senate, he actually started a bit a business, a small business, an inn, a kind of a bed and breakfast, and he went bankrupt very shortly after he opened the business. And he came and he said, you know, if I realized it was as hard to make money in this economy, given all the rules and regulations, he said that he had passed while he was in the Senate, he said he would never voted for any of them. Well, you ought to get the experience in life's ways, whether it's practice in medicine, running a business, doing all these other things, before you go to serve our country. And I know we're running short on time. I think uh, Colonel Joe Hart had a question. She's still your boss, isn't she, Colonel? <laughs> we all got one.
Why hadn't, why hadn't somebody picked it up? Sure, but I'm not about to mandate how we treat people at the federal government. And I plan on doing it. Yeah, but I need that back. Colonel, we'll we'll do that for sure. I'll, we'll I'll get they'll sure. get it to us. I'll visit with them. Make sure. That they All right. Well, we got, <laughs> we got, we got, we got other people we're getting ready here. They got to go to the airport. All I'm saying is I know how to read patents and I know how to read scientific journals. If you'll send them to me, I'll look at them. Yeah, I'll do it. Thank, Thank you. Why don't I just send you the numbers you Sure, you can. It's coburn.senate.gov and send it to me and tell them you talk to me at the town hall meeting and it'll get to me. We have... Um, we have, time, we have time for one more question. Uh, Craig Rennie had a question about who's actually writing the bills. Is, is Craig, is it? Uh, back there. things that I'd answer. First of all, you bet I'm concerned. Uh, I'm concerned with both these pieces of legislation. Uh, uh, they, actually, I need to take an anti-emetic. Uh, that's a non-vomiting pill uh, when I look at it. Now, how does a bill get written? In the case of the Senate bill, you had one staff director from Massachusetts who wrote the vast majority of this bill. He believes in socialism. He believes in government-run, single-payer health system. The whole intent behind that is to get us from where we are. When this system collapses under this bill, the default position will be single-payer government-run system. Now, that's how it got written. It was written. It was written with the help of what's called the Legislative Council, which are very smart people who know all the laws of the United States and write it supposedly to get rid of the unintended consequences. There are thousands of unintended consequences in this bill, thousands. And you cannot uh, approach one-sixth of our economy with a thousand page bill and think you got it all right. But don't kid yourself. The people in charge today think the government knows better how to run your life than you do. They believe that. Now that's a legitimate position. I'm not gonna, but that is totally contrary to what I think made this country great and will continue to make it great. And, and what we have to do, we, you know, 
remember what Rob Emanuel, Emanuel said. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We better get health care rammed through on these folks while we're in crisis. We'll scare them to death to think we got to do this to fix the problem. Well, there's real problems in health care. This just doesn't happen to be the answers to the real problems in health care. Uh, and, um, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. Uh, and Tom and I are going have to have to head off, but uh, we do this twice a week. This is going to be on the internet. We do a, a show called Senate Doctors. Uh, you can get on it at barrasso.senate.gov or coburn.senate.gov. Go to our websites, and we do it on Tuesday and Thursday. We've been doing this now for a couple of months. We're going to continue it all the way through the debate as maybe different bills or different amendments get proposed. And so instead of the eight-second sound bites that you hear on television, you get a chance to hear a little more discussion. But uh, we both want to thank you very much for letting us uh, be here. Uh, Congressman Bozeman, thank you very much for inviting us to your community. Wonderful folks. We would welcome all of these people into Wyoming if they ever get tired of still living here. So thanks for having us. You're going to stay?